um, should I should I wait a couple of minutes or um, should I just go ahead and start? You can go ahead. Okay, um, so hey, I'm Dr. Nicole Plenty. I'm one of the um, maternal fetal medicine um, physicians in my practice. I'm also an OBGYN. And welcome to your shadowing experience. Um, thank you guys so much for having me. I'm, I'm always um, elated to um, share my experiences and what I went through in medical school and residency with you guys so that you can have a full understanding of what it is to be um, a maternal fetal medicine doctor um, as well as an OBGYN. So what we'll talk about today is I'll share a little bit about myself and um, what I went through, uh, my undergrad experiences and medical school experience and residency and fellowship. Um, then we'll go into basically what it takes to actually go through training to become an OBGYN, um, what it takes to become an MFM. And then we'll go through the tip, my typical day of what I do um, majority of my day from when I wake up to um, when I finish clinic and when I go to bed. And then we'll talk about a couple of cases that are pretty common that I would take care of compared to a general OBGYN. So this is me and my family. Um, I am um, a mom. Uh, I'm a wife. Uh, I live in Houston, Texas. Uh, I practice full-time maternal fetal medicine um, and OBGYN in a suburb of Houston called Katy, um, but I also have privileges at several hospitals um, throughout the greater Houston area. Um, my hometown is a really small town called DeRitter, Louisiana. It's uh, by Lake Charles, so on the Texas-Louisiana border. Um, there's about, mm, about 10,000 people in my hometown, and I graduated with um, about 130, 140 other people. So um, a really small town, a really small class of people that I graduated from. Um, I went to undergrad at Xavier University of Louisiana. That is located in New Orleans, Louisiana. Um, it is number one in placing African-Americans into medical school and has been since 1993. Three. So if there's anybody in here that's like, I'm thinking about transferring undergrads, this is a really good undergrad to go to. Um, they're also um, number one in uh, graduating people into pharmacy school. So if you're considering other avenues of medicine, excuse me, you consider other avenues of medicine, then this is, you know, this is definitely a school for you. I went to med school at Tulane University School of Medicine that's also in New Orleans and I also did uh, an MPH at the same time so um, it's a four year dual degree program. Uh, my master's in public health is in health systems management and policy. Um, I decided to pick that up along the way because I was in the Katrina class so my first year Hurricane Katrina hit um, that was in you know, the end of August. Um, I started med school at the beginning of August and, um, you know, we were basically off of med school for about a couple of months, honestly, it was like eight weeks. And then if you're in medical school, you know that that first block exam is the brachial plexus. So we had to learn the head and neck and brachial plexus in like a week in medical school and do all the dissections and take tests without textbooks um, in Houston, um, because we all from Tulane went to Baylor um, to finish to do our first year of medical school. And so we had an accelerated first year of medical school without cell biology, but everything else was, was there, but sort of condensed to make sure we got through the first year. Um, so that Tulane experience was very special. And um, that is the reason why I picked up the Master's in Public Health, because no one could tell us exactly when our, when our you know, clinics were going to open back up, when our school was going to open back up. There was this mold infestation. And so I really um, had an interest in that and how the hurricane affected public health. And so that's why I ended up getting my MPH in um, health systems management and policy. Um, and a couple of us, I see a lot of us, it was like 18 of us started free clinics for HIV patients as first year uh, medical students. And so we did a lot of grant writing and driving back and forth from New Orleans to Houston um, to get that up and running. So it was a really good experience um, 
to be hands-on as even a first year medical student. And that clinic is still running now. Um, I then did residency and OBGYN um, at the University of Mississippi, aka Ole Miss, um, and I stayed there for fellowship as well. Um, my first job was at Community Health Network, and that's in Indianapolis, Indiana. Um, I uh, stayed at that job for three years, and you'll know once you finish, um, the majority of people in medicine stay at their first job for three years, and then they move. So it, I know people are like, oh my God, where am I going to work after I finish? Most people don't stay in the first job anyway. I did not stay either. Um, I ended up even right out of residency a year later, becoming the director at this um, at this facility, which was um, a, a good experience um, in terms of leadership um, that I felt like my MPH had prepared me for. Um, I'm now in Houston since that time. I did some travel medicine between um, me leaving Community Health Network having my son and then did travel medicine. And now I'm in Houston, Texas practicing. Um, the other stuff I do, of course, they're more important, right? So I'm a wife, I'm a mom. Um, I run a podcast called Pregnancy Pearls. Um, and I'm also a blogger and I'm a leader within the American Medical Association, the women physician section. And I'm also uh, an ACOG leader and was recently elected to the ACOG board of directors um, for the 2022-2024 um, uh, term. Um, and ACOG is the American College of OBGYNs. So, um, so here's a little bit about OB. So if you're in medical school and you're not really sure, like, how do you become an OBGYN? Well, first you do your four years of undergrad, right? You finish, you graduate with honors because you need to have really good grades to get into medical school. You then uh, take the MCAT your third year of med school. If you're going straight through, you are going to apply your, uh, not your third year of undergrad, excuse me. If you're, uh, and then you're applying your fourth year and in interviewing somewhere around that October period, if you're interviewing early, um, then you will, um, graduate, you get into medical school, you spend four years in medical school. Yes, there are some medical schools that do acceleration now that are three years. Um, and then after that, you're going to um, also, you know, you're figuring out once you go to your third year rotations, you're trying to figure out what field you go into. Um, you'll then say, hey, I love OB. You'll do a sub I in OB uh, at the beginning of your fourth year. You will apply apply for residencies the beginning of your fourth year, you all match in March of your fourth year into your residency of your choice, wherever you choose based on your rank throughout the nation. Um, and then you'll do four years of residency. During that four years of residency, um, you are doing rotations in GYN only, which is anything dealing with the ovaries, uterus, pelvic uh, floor, um, you're learning to take care of that OB, which is all pregnancy, um, urogynecology, which is all like pelvic floor, pelvic organ prolapse, things like that. Um, people that cough and their uterus falls out or their bladder is protruding. That's urogyne. Um, you're going to manage labor and delivery or manage people in labor and pregnancy. Um, you can do GYN oncology cases, although they're not really that detailed. So you're going to deal with, uh, you're going to do a GYN oncology rotation, but that's not what you're going to be doing as a general OBGYN. Um, you'll learn to do those things because you need the knowledge to know when to refer, basically. And then same thing with MFM, um, you'll do high risk pregnancy rotation and ultrasound um, while you're there to know how to handle and manage high risk pregnancies and when to refer them. And during that time, as an OBGYN resident, you're going to learn how to do a vaginal delivery, learn how to do a C-section from start to finish. So by the end of your first year, you know how to do both of those things. You're going to learn um, surgeries to repair the pelvic floor. So people that have pelvic organ prolapse or their bladder is protruding through the vagina when they cough. Um, you have some people that have to literally lift the uterus up in the vagina to actually be able to urinate because of pelvic organ prolapse. You'll learn how to diagnose that, how to stage that, how to manage that. Um, you'll learn how to do hysterectomies um, or removal of the uterus if there's problems with that. You'll learn to do myomectomies, which is removal of fibroids if people have problems with heavy vaginal bleeding on their menstrual cycles and things like that. You'll learn how to do an infertility workup, the basic 
Okay. Also, you would do an REI or reproductive endocrinology rotation. Um, that's when you learn your basic infertility workouts, but you're not doing a lot of infertility procedures, that is, during your residency or after you finish. Um, you're going to learn basic GYN and OB ultrasounds. And the reason you need to do that is because you need to make sure you know how to diagnose uterine masses, how to um, diagnose fibroids, how to diagnose ovarian masses, when to refer to an oncologist. And then your OB ultrasounds are just to do basic anatomy on babies to make sure those babies are structurally normal and how to date pregnancies and measure babies and make sure they're weighing the correct weight. Um, you're gonna know how to manage miscarriages, which means that you may do dilation and curatages which is when we remove the inside contents of the uterus after people have had demises or babies that have passed away during the first trimester. Um, you're gonna manage people that have chronic pelvic pain um, and know when to give medicines, when to give things like DMSO uh, infusion, which is like basically numbing medicine in the bladder. Um, you're going to do pap smears and well woman exams. You're gonna manage urinary incontinence or leakage of the bladder. And of course, you're gonna do normal primary care. So hypertension, diabetes, um, weight management, because OBGYNs are still considered primary care physicians in addition to specialists. It's like the only field that you can be both, right? You can decide if you wanna do all wellness, you can decide if you wanna you know, specialize and do um, only OB and refer to primary care doctors to do wellness. Um, I think of OB as like the best of all fields possible, <laughs> okay? Because if you go into surgery, no, not to surgeons, but if you go into surgery and for some reason you can't operate, you no longer have a job, Okay, um, so you can't be a surgeon and not operate um, unless you're like just teaching, but you're not clinically a surgeon anymore. Um, if you uh, want to do family medicine and you hate clinic, well, you can't just switch over and start operating. So OB is like the best of all fields. So if you want to do OB only and be a hospitalist without going to fellowship or anything like that, you can literally work seven shifts a month and only deliver babies and have don't have to do any clinic and you don't have do any GYN. If you don't like delivering babies, you can stop that part of your practice and then do GYN only and do all wellness exams, do all you know, hysterectomies, management of vaginal bleeding, management of pelvic pain, but everything that doesn't deal with the obstetric side. Um, if you want to do OB and do prenatal care and you don't want to do deliveries, you can be in a practice that does prenatal care and gets hospitalists to do your deliveries. So if you want to do all surgery, you can do all surgery and minimal clinic. Um, so it's the only field that as you grow and as you get further out, you can shape your practice to what you want it to look like. You can go from doing OB and GYN to only OB or only GYN, a combination of both. You want to be in a, a health department, only do well women exams and pap smears. You can do that. You want to only do surgeries. You can do that. So there's not any other field that I can think of that will allow the flexibility to sort of cater what you want to do, and then you not have to go back to fellowship, and then you not have to take a significant cut in your salary. So for me, I always encourage students to go into OBGYN because it is literally the best of all fields, okay, the best of all general fields, and I am biased, but, um, but if you think about it, it makes, it makes a lot of sense. All right, so the only thing that gets better than general OB is with use of specialized in MFM. Of course, I'm biased again because I am an MFM. And MFM, of course, stands for maternal fetal medicine. And that's exactly what it is. We take care of the maternal side of pregnancies, the fetal side of pregnancy, and we act as internists, basically. So we're like a combination of a radiologist as well as an obstetrician and an internal medicine doctor and a general surgeon put together. So that is what you can think of when you think about maternal fetal medicine. So to be an MFM, you're gonna go through four years of undergrad, then four years of medical school, like we talked about before, you're gonna match into your residency. There's no way to skip over doing the residency and going straight to MFM. There's no tracks that do that yet, okay? Then you're going to do three more years of fellowship. So in your last year of residency, 
um, when everybody else is getting ready to go to their jobs, you're actually getting your application ready to apply for fellowship. So third year, you submit your application by the end of third year, you're going to interview at the very beginning of your fourth year of residency, and then you will know if you've matched into fellowship by September, like first week of September, you, you will have your match. So why is it different than just general OB? So when you do MFM, you no longer do GYN, okay? You don't do really any GYN procedures. Although if you wanted to still do OBGYN, you could, but most MFMs stop doing the general stuff and solely concentrate on the high-risk pregnancy aspect. And so you do you deal with high-risk pregnancies. So anybody that is over age 35, um, has morbid obesity, um, that it can be something as simple as that, you would be a consultant on those pregnancy cases. Um, or it can be something extremely high risk, like cancer in pregnancy or maternal heart disease, patients that have heart attacks in pregnancies, patients that have had a stroke in pregnancy, um, ICU admissions in pregnancy. Um, you're also gonna diagnose fetal anomalies. So um, you're gonna diagnose complex heart defects in babies. Um, you're gonna diagnose you know, thyroid gorders in babies, brain defects. You're also gonna do a lot of OB genetics. So you're gonna do genetic counseling. You're gonna diagnose Down syndrome. You're gonna do amniocentesis, which is a procedure where we put a needle inside of the uterus and withdraw fluid and send it off for the baby's genetic makeup to see if this baby is genetically normal. Um, you're gonna do a lot of procedures that deal with genetic workups um, uh, in pregnancy as an MFM specialist. Um, and then you're also gonna do fetal intervention. So if there's a baby that has fluid on the lung, you're gonna be the person that's gonna do an in utero shunt before you deliver them um, to try to drain that. If you have a bladder obstruction in babies, bladder obstructions can cause the kidneys to be enlarged and eventually not function correctly. So we would be the people that would do bladder shunts to try to drain urine out of the bladder so that the urine can come from the kidneys through the ureter into the bladder and continue to drain out through the shunt. Um, so there's a lot of fetal intervention um, with maternal fetal medicine. And then we deal with a lot of, um, of multiple gestations. So twins, triplets, quads. Um, we are the people that take care of those super high risk pregnancies. So as an MFM and in fellowship, you're going to learn to do more high risk C-sections. So that's like C-sections that are for babies that may have an airway obstruction. So if they have a tracheoesophageal fistula or a connection between the esophagus and the trachea, which requires immediate inter in intubation, we'd be doing things like exit procedures. So delivering the baby halfway, intubating the baby, and then handing the baby off to um, the pediatric surgeon so they can work on the baby. Anytime a mom is on ECMO or a need for uh, the blood and kidneys to work outside of the body to then pump for the mom for any of uh, any reason like heart failure or kidney failure. Um, we're gonna be involved in those. Um, if the mom needs a cesarean hysterectomy, so if you have a mom that has a placenta accreta, which is when the placenta invades through the wall of the uterus, delivery of that could cause severe bleeding. And so moms would need to remove the whole uterus after removing the baby. We would be the people to do that. Um, I already said fetal shunts. You'd be learning fetal shunts in fellowship. Um, you're also going to learn a lot of ultrasound. I mean, 75% of what I do is ultrasound and diagnosis of fetal anomalies. Um, we're going to learn how to, how to diagnose those and manage those in terms of what happens to the baby after delivery. So we're the people that tell the NICU, this is what we need you to do for the baby after delivery. This is when the baby needs to be delivered. Um, any baby that needs to have a preterm delivery would be, that decision would be made by a maternal fetal medicine specialist. Anybody that's in the ICU and they're pregnant, so critical care pregnant patients are gonna be managed by an MFM, sometimes in conjunction with another um, a critical care doctor, like a pulmonary critical care doctor um, and their OBGYN, but we would be managing the actual pregnancy in the pregnancy and, and um, the pregnancy part of that care. And we would also be coordinating things with the ICU doctors to say, hey, these are the different parameters in pregnancy in pregnancy versus outside of pregnancy so that we're not hyperventilating 
a pregnant woman on the ventilator. Um, we are also the coordination, uh, the coordinators. So if a mom has uh, renal disease, we would be checking and monitoring their kidney status and then getting the nephrologist involved when they need to be on dialysis. Um, like I said before, you learn how to manage different types of twins, different types of triplets and different types of quads because there are like a lot of different types of those. <laughs> and then we do high risk research. And that is something that you would do as a fellow as during your fellowship, 50% of your fellowship is research. So we do a lot of bench research, a lot of pipetting, um, a lot of rat research, a lot of lab research. Um, can't really get through MFM fellowship without doing some type of research. Although a lot of MFMs after they finish don't do any research. Um, and then we do do some total care. Sometimes we do consultation only. So when I say total care, meaning if we have a patient that has a history of cancer in pregnancy, some OBs would refer that patient directly to me to manage all of their care and coordinate things with their hematologist so that I can tell the hematology oncologist, hey, this chemo is safe in pregnancy. This is not safe in pregnancy. So we would be the people that takes over total care, including the delivery and postpartum care versus doing consultation only, which is what we do the majority of time, if we have people that are not super high risk, um, we would be like, okay, this person has type one diabetes, we would manage the insulin pump, we would um, change, we manage them in labor, but we wouldn't necessarily do the delivery, we'd be doing co management with the OBGYN. So a lot of the time we do a lot of co management, the delivery stays with the general OBGYN, we're just taking care of that specific high risk issue. Um, and the reason it's taken care of by an MFM and not an internal medicine doctor is because there's different things that happen in pregnancy, the body is different. The blood volume doubles in pregnancy. Um, the parameters for a ventilator is different in pregnancy. Parameters for diabetic control is different in pregnancy because we have to be very, very careful and very strict to not increase the risk of the baby passing away and to also not increase the risk of things like DKA and strokes and heart attacks that would ordinarily not happen outside of pregnancy, but that pregnant women are more at risk for during pregnancy. Okay, so my typical day as an MFM that practices full time is I wake up somewhere around six. Now, when I was being good and working out and getting on the Peloton every day, I would wake up at five, get on the Peloton at five, do a 30 to 45 minute uh, spin, take a shower, and then I'm still up checking emails, getting dressed around six. Um, I usually have a conference call, usually two, three days a week. Um, if I don't have a conference call, I usually try to round in the morning so that I don't have to round during the day at lunch. And those conference calls are usually multidisciplinary conference calls. And so we're trying to set up calls where everybody's on the same page. And those calls are managed by MFMs to talk about moms that have heart disease. Hey, if we need to do different fluid management on those patients, if we need to be in the critical care ICU immediately after delivery, if a patient needs to have be on nitro um, to keep um, the vasculature um, more compliant um, so that we're not dropping or increasing the blood pressure based on different cardiac diseases. Then we have multidisciplinary conferences that may involve a cardiologist, it may involve the critical care providers, the general OBGYN if they're involved, um, of course, the MFM team, the NICU, um, or any other subspecialist. So if it's a patient that has a history of a stroke, we want to make sure the neurologist and the neurosurgeons on board. The patient that has kidney disease, we want to make sure the nephrologist is on board. So everybody that could be as a part of the patient's care team, uh, we want to make sure everybody's on the right page. So we have these conference calls um, several times a week um, with different patients um, to make sure that everybody's on the same page just in case the patient comes in for delivery early. Then my clinic usually starts around 8.30. Um, my high-risk clinic com is composed of preconception consults. So talking to moms that may have a history of stroke, heart attack, cancer, diabetes, thyroid disease, talking to them about their risk, trying to optimize their care before they get pregnant to decrease their risk during the pregnancy. Um, so we'll do preconception consults, do ultrasounds, some of low-risk ultrasounds, meaning patients that have no risk factors of having genetic issues or babies with anomalies, or high-risk ultrasounds, 
patients that have an abnormal ultrasound in their OB's office that get sent to us or patients that have abnormal genetic screening and testing um, beforehand and then get referred to us for further workup. Um, I could do amniocentesis, which is like I said before, um, a, a procedure where we insert a needle into the uterus, withdraw fluid, send it off for the baby's genetic makeup based on what we see on the ultrasound. Um, I also do some care of just normal stuff like comorbidities in pregnancy, like diabetes, without doing ultrasound. Then around lunch, um, I usually have meetings. I may have a meeting one or two days a week. Um, or if I don't have a meeting, then I may go around if I have new consults in the hospital. Um, around 1 p.m., I have a preconception consult. That's a standard time that I have preconception consults. I usually do a couple of those a day. Um, and then after that, the high-risk clinic starts again from 1.30 to about 5 p.m. Um, my group takes call a week at a time. So most MFM practices, the MFM doctor is not in the hospital overnight during deliveries because most MFMs don't do a lot of deliveries. We only do high-risk deliveries, usually C-sections or cesarean hysterectomies are things that really take a, a group effort um, to get a patient safely through pregnancy. Every once in a while, we'll do a delivery for somebody that's been transferred to us that has like a prior C-section times three that we anticipate will have severe pelvic adhesive disease or a lot of scar tissue inside. But routinely, we're not like the OBGYNs that are taking call in the hospital every three to four days because they're doing five or six deliveries or even 10 deliveries a day. That is not MFM. MFMs usually take call as consult only. We get phone calls from the OBs overnight to answer questions. We may go in for very critical care, critical care patients that are in the ICU or that are getting transported in that may need further expertise to get them through the night. Otherwise, it's answering the phone at night, answering the OBs questions, telling them what to do over the phone, and then seeing them the next morning, which is why I usually round in the morning if I have a new consult. We're on call one week at a time from home and I'm on call one week every five weeks. So the amount, the frequency of being on call really depends on how big your group is. So if you're an MFM group of two, then you may be on call every other week. If you're an MFM group of eight, then you may be on call every eighth week. So it just depends on how big your group is. Um, my group, we have five people in the South call pool and four people in the North. And so my group has nine people total. So we tend to be on call once every five weeks because of I, because I'm in the South call pool. So if you're looking for a job, just make sure you ask how frequently you're on call. Okay. And like I said before, we do occasional deliveries. Okay. Not frequent occasional deliveries. Does anybody have any questions before we move forward with the cases? Anyone? Um, can you talk about how you knew that this was the right specialty for you? Like, was there like a specific aha moment for you? So for me, I went into OB uh, first because I had a cousin that passed away from complications of eclampsia. And preeclampsia is when you have high blood pressure and protein in your urine. That's like the diagnosis of preeclampsia. Pre meaning before eclampsia. Eclampsia happens when you have a seizure because of the high blood pressure and the breakdown of that blood brain barrier. Okay. And so that can be pretty detrimental because if you seize in pregnancy and you have hypertensive crisis, you can have a stroke, you can have a heart attack, you can have aspiration pneumonia. And so my cousin ended up having severe blood pressures, aspiration pneumonia after her eclamptic seizure, and then developed acute respiratory distress syndrome or what's called ARDS abbreviated. And then she ended up passing away because of ARDS, superimposed pneumonia and eclampsia. So um, when I was in medical school, I started doing, now that happened in undergrad. When I was in medical school, I started doing research in preeclampsia. And I really liked, you know, women's health. And I, I liked the fact that, um, you know, it was a generally happy field, like generally like people are happy to have babies. And so that was one thing that really drew me there. Like the interest that because of my cousin and the complications she had during pregnancy and the, just the interest I had in research in the field. And then once I started shadowing people in OB, I was like, okay, this is really, this is a cool field. And then once I did my rotation in medical school, 
it was like, okay, I really want to do this. I, I like the rush of delivering babies. I love the, how fast paced everything was. Um, I liked everything about from doing pelvic exams to delivering babies, doing C-sections to doing surgeries. Like I like the diversity within the field. Like I can be doing surgery all day today. I can be doing deliveries today. I can be in clinic the, the next day. So for me, it was just a diverse field. Everything was different. There was a rush every day, it was fast paced. I love that. And so um, MFM came natural because the whole reason I went into it was because my cousin had complications. And so um, dealing with that higher risk population, like trying to be the person to figure out what the cause is or the fixer, if you will, the end all expert in the field um, is why I decided to, to go into MFM. And so I would say, if you're thinking about OB, one, know that it's fast paced. Like it's not slow. You're not gonna have time to sit there and fiddle your thumbs. Like it's not that kind of field. Um, it is for somebody that's like, go get her on your feet, ready to, you know, ready to go can look things up really quickly, good with your hands, like surgery, um, but you also like the time to sit there and be a part of someone's like greatest moment of their life. And so that is why um, I went into it. Like I love sharing that, like getting people through pregnancy, especially like high risk pregnancies, is like the most rewarding thing, like to get a patient through a pregnancy when they thought they wouldn't survive or when they thought they would never have a kid, never get pregnant is like the best feeling. Like patients are like beyond grateful when you get them safely through pregnancy. So, I mean, it's just a rewarding experience. So I would say if you are somebody that feels like that, if you don't want to ever be bored. If you like being fast paced, if you like being in the OR, if you like delivering babies, if you like that experience, then you would love OB. If you're somebody that's like, I want to be in clinic, sit, take time with patients, but I don't like the OR, then OB is not for you. So people think, oh, well, if I do OB versus general surgery, I'm not going to have as much surgery. That is not, OB is a lot of surgery. So if you don't like surgery, you will not like OB. So you have to like surgery and you have to like clinic to want to do OB because it's a mesh of, of both of those. Now, once you finish, you can cater what you want to do, um, you know, uh, based on if you like, you know, surgery, you don't have to do as much surgery. If you don't like GYN, you don't have to do GYN. But in the beginning, you have to be able to do both. So that's why I did it. Um, some people, um, I've, I've known people that went into OB and they hated it and they switched fields because they hated the fact that they were always in the OR. They hated how much blood there is. I mean, there's a lot of blood in a vaginal delivery and a C-section. It's not like an unbloody field because you got blood and amniotic fluid mixed. So it looks like way more blood than it really is. Um, some people don't like that. So I would say just follow your gut, like whatever, whichever rotation you do. And you're like, man, I cannot wait to get to this rotation. That's the field you should go into. Regardless of what everybody else thinks. If you're like, I'm excited to read about these cases and this is what I want to go into. Like, I'm, I'm happy to go there. Then that's the field you want to go into. Now, if you thought you want to be a general surgeon and you're like, oh my God, I'm waking up at four in the morning. I'm doing a Whipple that takes six hours, but everybody says it only takes two. And I'm in the OR all day long. I haven't eaten anything. And you find yourself grumpy. Don't go into that field. Even if you're like, I thought I wanted to be a surgeon because it sounds cool, but in all actuality, I'm miserable or the attending's miserable, don't go into that field. Like trust yourself and follow your gut. Okay, thank you so much, by the way. That was really helpful. Um, no it's super inspiring, like hearing you talk about your experiences. I don't think anyone else has any questions. If they do, okay. can you see the chat? Or um, Oh, my major in undergrad. So my major in undergrad was biology pre-med. And I minored in chemistry, but realistically, it doesn't matter what you major in, as long as you do the prerequisites, um, and and you can find those on the ACGME website. As long as you hit the prereqs, it doesn't matter. Um, I had people in my class, and I went to Tulane, and so we had a diverse group of, of backgrounds. I had people that were straight out of undergrad, people that had done 
ex other experiences. I had a vet in my class that decided to go back and it, we joked because he could take care of every species and genre <laughs> because it was a vet and a doctor now. Um, I had somebody that had, a, had an undergrad degree in chess playing, English degrees, math degrees, it doesn't matter. Major in what you're passionate about, but just make sure that you check off those prereqs. Now, the easiest way for me to check off the prereqs was to major in biology because you automatically have the prereqs within that major. A lot of my friends uh, majored in chemistry. So the majority of people that I know either had majored in biology, chemistry, or biochemistry. But again, you can major in whatever you want. Just make sure you have the prereqs because you don't want to go through everything and be like, man, I need to take orgo now. Like, <laughs> get that all the way and then do some other electives, but just make sure that you get your prereqs. I hope that answers your question. Anybody else? Okay, so let's talk about like typical cases that an MFM would see. So these are real cases. Um, I have, these are not real images because obviously that would be a HIPAA violation. And so um, the images are not the images of the patient. I, these are images that a mentor of mine had and sent to me that could fit the picture, okay? So the first case is a 32 year old, gravita three, which means that she's been pregnant three times, para one, which means that she's had one term pregnancy, zero, meaning she's had no preterm pregnancies, one, she's had one abortion or miscarriage, one, and one living person, one living baby, okay? So she's been pregnant three times, she has one living baby, she's had one miscarriage. She presents with quads, so four babies, at 21 weeks and three days. Um, she was in preterm labor at that point, she was admitted because she had premature rupture of membranes, so the water broke of twin A. And so this is pretty much a real picture of somebody that has quads. So you can see one, two, three, four babies. And I chose this picture because it's pretty similar to how this patient presented. Twin uh, quad one was a singleton by itself. So there's a thick dividing membrane between one and two. That's how I know it's a singleton by itself. So these would be di-di pairs basically meaning there are two separate pregnancies that just happen to happen at the same time. And then three and four were the monodi pair, meaning they share a placenta, okay? So singleton, singleton, monodi pair, but four babies, okay? So um, she presented, she had leakage of uh, fluid with twin A or quad A. I say twin A, because that's how we call them. We like twin A and B, and then C and D are the monodi um, pair but she ruptured the first baby. So what did we do? We put her in the hospital and we monitor her. So if you have one baby that was 21 weeks and three days and you ruptured, usually we'd be counseling the mom to say, hey, this is a pre-viable rupture of membranes. I mean, before 22 weeks and five days, that is the point that the baby has a, a good chance of survival. When I say good, meaning 50-50 chance of survival. Neurologically intact survival in the 22nd week is super low. Um, so Houston being the biggest medical center in the nation, um, taking data from the women's hospital, which I'm staff at, they deliver 12,000 babies a year. They're the busiest delivering hospital in the state. Um, and out of that, they've had 45 22-weekers, okay, that they've done full intervention on. Of those 45 22 weekers, um, 11 of them survived long enough to be intubated and make it at least a month. Out of those 11, three of them survived long enough to go home and be what's considered neurologically intact. And when I say neurologically intact, the, the end is like age two and a half at this point. Okay, so there's one that's meeting normal milestones, walking, talking, eating, um, doing the things that it's supposed to do uh, for a two and a half year old. One of them has a G-tube, so a feeding tube still, but it's walking and have appropriate language development for two. Um, and the other one um, has a G-tube as well as, I believe, a brace, a leg brace, but seemingly cognitively normal and meeting normal milestones. Okay, so just to give you some background, that's what we mean when we say 22 weeks. So we got somebody that's ruptured at 21 weeks and three days of one baby. 
All four babies are still in place. We admit her, monitor her. Usually we would be telling people, hey, you're pre-viable. We recommend delivery, even though we know the baby's not going to survive. Because once you rupture, you have a really high risk of infection, okay? If you have a mom that has an infection, she can have what's called a septic abortion uh, or sepsis really, really quickly. And so if you're pre-viable, we recommend delivery to avoid that. Some moms elect not to deliver. And so we keep them in the hospital and monitor them. Once they are 23 weeks, we will start antibiotics. They not, they're not for infection. They help delay the onset of labor. So sort of keep them pregnant um, longer to try to get them further into the pregnancy. We will also give steroids for fetal lung maturity. Um, so that will help accelerate lung development, decrease the time of babies in the NICU with steroids, and then give them magnesium, which helps stabilize babies' little brain cells to prevent seizures from happening. Um, we give them that for 24 hours. And she's not 23 weeks yet though, right? She's only 21 weeks and, 21, uh, weeks and three days. Um, and so we just admitted her and monitored her, okay? Monitored her to make sure she wasn't gonna go into labor at home. Two days later, she had rupture of membranes of the second singleton, which was twin B, okay? She ended up delivering. Um, she ended up delivering the first baby the next day. Then twin B was still inside. So you have three babies inside. And then after that, we have twin B deliver, didn't survive. And then we have C and D pair. Both of those ruptured exactly at 22 weeks. Um, C delivered shortly after that. Um, C lived for three days. Um, and then D passed away a few hours after delivery. And so this is not a picture of that the baby C, but this is almost like what baby C looked like. So this is real a real 22 week baby. Um, and so we have to counsel moms and tell moms, hey, listen, the likelihood of your baby is going to survive and be neurologically intact, meaning walk, talk, go to school with the other kids' own age is extremely low. Okay, 23 weeks, the neurologically intact survival is only about 10 to 15 percent. And like I told you before, we got three out of 11 known kids at 22 weeks that are surviving and being neurologically intact. The eyes are still fused at 22 weeks. Um, so sometimes we have to surgically separate the eye, the eyelids. Um, the, sometimes the lungs are developed, sometimes they're not not developed. They're never developed at 22 weeks, but sometimes we can intubate and ventilate them. Sometimes we can't um, at 22 weeks. The skin is very thin, paper thin. So babies have very easy bruising. Um, their skin tends to shed. They're gonna be intubated for a prolonged period of time. So we're the people that talking to the family about, about intervention versus palliative care, me just holding and supporting those babies um, until they pass away um, versus doing everything they can, including chest compressions, um, intubation, lines, blood transfusions, and things like that. Does anybody have any questions about that? That's a typical case. This happened literally last month, okay? We deal with a lot of quads and triplets um, uh, as MFMs. We are those people, and quads and triplets do have a higher risk of needing uh, of going to labor preterm. And the more babies you have inside, the more likely the more likely you are to have preterm labor. And so that's why when people have like six babies inside, we have to legally counsel them about um, selective reduction into twins because twins have a much higher likelihood of making it pat like into the late third trimester and having neurologically intact survival than triplets or quads. Um, some patients get mad at us when we have to talk to them about that. Um, but legally, we have to, if you have more than triplets, we have to talk to you about selective reduction. Um, that is the job of the MFM. Um, we follow them very closely depending on what type of multiples they have and uh, recommend delivery at certain times, okay? So that's one case. So another case, um, which is super common right now, um, is this is the second case. Um, it's a 23 year old who's 29 weeks pregnant with COVID-19. She initially had mouth shortness of breath and a sore throat after going to a cookout at her aunt's house. Um, she was admitted three days later due to severe shortness of breath, a cough and fever. She was intubated two days later. Um, and the baby was delivered via stat C-section due to an abnormal fetal heart rate tracing. And I say that this is common because it's Wednesday and I have had four COVID consults that have been intubated during pregnancy. And so um, it is MFMs and ACOG now, the American College of OBGYNs, 
are recommending that patients in pregnancy get vaccinated for COVID-19 to prevent something like this from happening. As you can see, this patient is intubated. She is pregnant. This big tube is, is just going through a central line. She's on ECMO um, to try to help her kidneys function. Um, COVID-19 uh, prevent presents with severe pneumonia in patients and respiratory failure in patients that get symptomatic in pregnancy. And patients that are pregnant can become severely symptomatic very quickly. You can go from just having a mild cough to all of a sudden need to be intubated a couple of days later. So um, we are the people that recommend the stuff in pregnancy to get people out of COVID-19. Um, so so MFMs treat people in pregnancy with COVID-19 pneumonia that require ICU admission. We're managing the event on these patients. Um, we're recommending convalescent plasma and remdesivir, which are two agents that, uh, honestly, some of the only stuff we have. So convalescent plasma obviously has antibodies from patients that have had COVID that we inject into patients with COVID now to help their body fight off the infection faster. Um, remdesivir being an antiviral is something that tries to reduce the viral load of COVID to shorten the course of COVID-19. Obviously there's no cure for COVID-19. Um, COVID can cross the placenta and infect the baby. So we monitor the baby's status, but the baby status usually is dependent on the mom's status. So if mom's respiratory status decreases and she's not oxygenated, oxygenating well, we then start to see the fetal heart rate tracing become abnormal. And when the fetal heart rate tracing becomes abnormal, that can be very dangerous for babies passing away. And so moms that have COVID-19 pneumonia have an extremely high risk of stillbirth and miscarriage if they're earlier in the pregnancy, stillbirth if they're later in the pregnancy. And so if they're intubated in the hospital, we have to make the decision about when to deliver the baby and when to not deliver the baby. We don't want to deliver the baby when the mom is coding, um, but we don't want to um, deliver severely preterm babies unless we absolutely have to. So it's a fine line of when to deliver the baby, when to not. Moms that are delivered while they have active COVID um, have a severe risk of dying because of third spacing and fluid shifting. So like I said before, the blood volume doubles in pregnancy. I mean, by six weeks, you have twice as much blood volume, and then it gradually increases as the pregnancy progresses. So if you have a patient that now is no longer pregnant and has acute blood loss, um, what's going to happen naturally is that you're going to have that fluid is going to try to shift into the interstitium or into the tissues so the mom can urinate it out and over the next couple of weeks go back down to its pre-pregnancy volume. Usually that third spacing shifting happens within 24 to 72 hours after delivery. And so if you have somebody that already has pulmonary compromise and then we are adding uh, an overflow or influx of fluid shifts, that fluid can shift into the lungs and cause pulmonary edema, um, pulmonary effusions um, and worsen the status of pneumonia. And that's how patients do very poorly after delivery. Even patients that are asymptomatic with COVID-19 if they deliver while they have COVID, they're at risk for pulmonary edema and effusions and respiratory collapse. So we have to monitor them very closely and really make informed decisions about when's the optimal time to deliver these moms um, for the baby's benefit and for their benefit as well. And so um, this was a patient that I had about two weeks ago that we had to uh, deliver. Baby did fine, baby's still in the NICU. Um, mom is still in the unit. Okay, but she is extubated. So that is a, a good thing. But we do have sometimes we're proning patients, even in pregnancy, meaning we're putting them face down, sort of entering down the at a tilt to try to help clear secretions as fast as possible and try to help with ventilation. Once we get to the point where we're proning, usually then it's time to put patients on ECMO and then proceed with delivery. Does anybody have any questions for me? Okay, well, if no questions, thank you guys so much for the opportunity for, to present to you guys about maternal fetal medicine. Um, I hope that we can stay in touch. So I'm already following Medical Marvels on Instagram. I've, I'm almost certain because I'm sharing all of your posts. Um, so uh, you can guys, you guys can follow me on Instagram as well at pregnancy underscore pearls. And I'm also on Facebook um, at pregnancy pearls. Um, 
And uh, if you have any questions at all, you can email me directly at pregnancypearls at gmail.com. Um, like I said before, I have a podcast called Pregnancy Pearls. Um, if you go to the link tree, which is just linktree.com forward slash pregnancy pearls, you can see all of my platforms there, um, including my website. So um, let me know if you follow me, um, send me a DM and tell me, hey, I met you on Medical Marvels um, so that I can know who you are. And um, is there a way that I can see everybody here today? There should be a way. Also, there's a question in the chat. Just to okay. Um, I think there's gallery mode. Yes. Yeah, but nobody wants to turn their cameras on today. Oh, right. <laughs> turn those cameras on. Let me see y'all's faces. So the question is, uh, with high-risk pregnancies, how have you learned to cope with loss and stress of the profession? It is a daunting, it, you know, honestly, it is it's definitely um, an emotional field, right? Um, people ask all the time, because I mean, as a high risk person, I'm the person that loses babies and I'm the person that loses moms in pregnancy usually. I mean, general OBGYNs do have experienced stillbirth and loss, but usually uh, I'm the person that's trying to staff them and get the babies out and um, have to tell them really bad news and counsel them about genetic issues. Um, I just find that I try to be as honest with patients as possible and realistic with expectations. So if I know that there's going to be a baby that has a really high risk of loss, like a small baby, because um, small babies have increased risk of stillbirth, or if I have a mom that has uncontrolled diabetes, I, I'm honest with my patients. I'm say, I say, you know what, this is, you know, really your baby has a chance of passing away. And I try to de-stress as much as possible. Like I talk to um, my husband about things that's going on. Obviously I don't reveal to him the patient's name, but I talk to him about what's going on. I talk to my colleagues and my coworkers about what's going on. Um, we usually like go out at least once a month to vent to each other. Now in the virtual world, we do these virtual chats um, when we, you know, when we talk about it. But honestly, you sort of get used to it. You know, you get used to delivering bad news um, and you get used to comforting patients. And I could go in one room and I, I cry with patients. Like I will cry with the patient in a second um, because now that I'm a mom, I know what it feels like to like have a baby. Um, and I've also had a miscarriage myself. And so I know how it feels to lose a pregnancy as well. And so I think when you're honest with patients and when you're vulnerable with patients, um, they know that you're doing the best that you can. Even when I have patients that have bad outcomes, they still thank me for the care that they that I've given because they know and understand that I'm doing the best that I can. So, um, but I have, I have, I mean, there are sometimes I need to go to counseling because I'm like, I've lost three babies this month and I'm emotional or I have a patient in the unit and I'm like spending all this time with them or talking to the husband every day and they've been on the vent for two months and I've lost them. I mean, and it, it is a very emotional experience, like extremely emotional, but it's very rewarding when you have somebody that's on the vent and you get them off or you have somebody that you didn't think was going to make it and they make it. So it is daunting, but it's re really rewarding at the same time. Does that answer your question, <laughs> Samantha? Okay, perfect. Um, okay, so how do you, I balance um, personal life and career? So I like to keep my life very separate, okay? And so for me, um, the reason that I went into MFM was because I wanted a work-life balance. So I feel like OBs are on call way too much. If you're delivering your own patients, you're going in at two, three in the morning. Like I don't, I did not want that lifestyle. I wanted a family. I wanted a husband. I wanted to go to work, come home. If I'm on call, I'm on call, but I'm still on call from home. So for me, I have a very good work-life balance. I go to work, I come home, I separate everything and, 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 and which allows me to be involved in the AMA and ACOG and other things because I don't take work home. I don't chart at home. If I get to work early, I finish charting. I'm, I chart at lunch if I have time. I chart between patients, but I'm very cognizant of not bringing work home. And I recommend that people don't like set a time for yourself. So if you have clinic from and patients are scheduled from 830 to 345 or four, they're usually going to leave there around 430, 445. Tell yourself, I have got to leave the office by 530. And so whatever you get done, you get done on your lunch break 
up to 5.30 or you come early the next morning. Um, don't bring that home because when you, when you find yourself charting, and, and there are people that do this, like chart until 10, 11, 12 o'clock at night because they haven't found a system that works for them to allow them to be productive at work or the systems are too antiquated. Communicate that to your colleagues to say, we need to fix this because I'm gonna get a divorce if I don't fix this. Um, and tell yourself, hey, I need to limit patients. Like this is not a healthy amount of patients that I should see. So you have to know yourself, know how fast you can work. And if you get overwhelmed, take a moment for yourself. I always tell people, put in self-care days. So for me, I knew that my second job and the reason I have a, I, I didn't stay at my first job was because my first job had me working four and a half days a week, which really is five days a week. Like my thing is if you step foot in the door that fifth day, that's five days because somebody's going to call you and ask you to do something. You're supposed to get off at 12, but you really don't get off until two. And so then you look up and your whole day's gone. So I knew I wanted to work four days a week. That allowed me to get the fifth day off. Okay. So I always have a three-day weekend unless I, it's my week of call. That is what I wanted. That helps me if I want to take a trip every weekend. I can take Friday, Saturday, Sunday, every every week I have three days off. Um, and so that allows me um, good work-life balance. So I would definitely say know what you can tolerate. Um, don't do anything for money. Don't go into a field for money. You can make money in any field of medicine, you can make money. People don't tell you that. But in any field of medicine, you can make really good money. So don't do anything for money. Um, if you love it, you will. there will be other opportunities for you to make money um, because people that start off with very high earnings, and MFM is a very high earning field, but you have to say, you know, am I willing to cut my salary some to work four days a week? Well, yeah. And then other opportunities come that compensate for that loss. So um, know what you want. And if you want a family, make sure you put them first. So if my kid has a doctor's appointment, I'm planning that ahead of time. I'm going through my scheduling saying his 24 month checkup needs to be on this day. I'm gonna schedule this on my day off. And if there's no availability on a Friday, I'm literally scheduling my day off. Like, oh, he can only go on Wednesday, block my schedule in the morning. So for me, my family comes first. I hope that answers your question, Maribel. Any other questions for me? Yeah, so thank you so much for coming again. Um, I really enjoyed listening to all your experiences and you know your PowerPoint was amazing. Um, yeah, and everyone's saying thank you in the chat. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for having me. It's really exciting when people that are in medical school in residency um, or even undergrad are really trying to make sure they get as much exposure and as much experience as possible. Like this, honestly, learning about the specialties like you guys are doing now is like giving you way ahead of a leg up on everybody else that's going into medical school because everybody's gonna be like, I don't know what MFM is. And you can be like, I know exactly what MFM is. So thank you guys for taking the time um, to listen. And like I say, if I can be of assistance to anybody, um, if anybody wants to actually, if you're in Houston and you wanna do some actual shadowing, I'm always available. Um, if you need help getting connected to a mentor, um, let me know, just reach out and let me know, okay? Okay, thank you. Thanks, bye, you guys have a good day.